I've been bothered by something for a while now. Actually, in truth, bothered is probably an ill-chosen word. Vexed is probably a much more to-the-point word. I've been vexed by something for quite a while now. And I'm apparently not the only one. I have been getting I am after I am and email after email from people who are familiar with my YouTube site and my videos uh, to confront a particular subject. And that subject is the theory of the Christian pagan synthesis. In other words, the theory that Christianity merely represents an amalgamation of earlier Near Eastern mythology. And it's not really its own story, it's not unique, it simply represents the next evolutionary rung in the uh, myth-making traditions of that particular part of the world. And I can understand why Christians and theists particularly have such a difficult time with this. And I really do have to say that in terms of skeptical arguments against Christianity or against theism, generally, this is probably the best argument that's been concocted. All the other arguments, uh, a little bit of philosophy, uh, logical thinking, being able to piece together rational arguments, you don't really need any kind of specific detailed instruction to be able to come up with arguments to combat atheists on a regular basis. If you wanted to debunk or to at least confront the idea of determinism versus free will, you don't really need to be a theologian. You don't need, you don't need to be a philosopher. You just need to know the rudiments of those two skills. With this particular argument, uh, that is the copycat thesis, there's the added expectation of above and beyond any a priori understandings of philosophy or logic that you might have, you also need what comes down to some fairly detailed and specific instruction about history and about cultural anthropology, which is something that most people really haven't delved into. Uh, they haven't felt that they've needed to. So I can understand the difficulty that lots of people have when trying to confront this particular issue. So it doesn't really take a genius to see why concocting an argument like this is really a stroke of genius on the parts of, uh, of the skeptics out there, the people who cobbled this particular argument together. It's such that only a very specific group or community of people can confront it effectively. Only really historians and anthropologists have the means or the tools to be able to confront this, or people who are closet historians or anthropologists and who take that particular discipline very seriously and spend a great deal of time and study and careful research on that particular subject. I can see the benefits of a skeptic for using this argument above and beyond the philosophical arguments that they use. But... <laughs> It is overcomable, believe me, and I'm about to do it. So my argument here is going to come in two forms. The first form is pretty straightforward. It's going to address exactly the historicity of the claims that these particular pagan myths uh, were uh, predecessors to the Christian myth. There is some uh, evidence that some of them are, and there's evidence that some of them aren't. My second part of my argument, the second part of my argument rather, is going to be to show that even if all of them were true, the way that this particular issue is being used by the skeptics is actually a boon for Christianity. It's not a bane for Christianity. The skeptic will normally begin his or her argumentation by uh, showcasing parallels between Christianity and a multitude of different myths from the Near East, and some not from the Near East, some all the way from India, Krishna being the primary example of a myth from India that they tried to show as a synthesis to Christianity, which I think is utterly ridiculous. I mean, the other myths from the Near East, well, I mean, they have proximity at least, but they'll usually go about by showing parallels between this myth or that myth. They'll say, well, this god was born on the 25th of December, was born of a virgin, uh, death, burial, resurrection, 12 disciples, did miracles, uh, so on and so forth. And in the case of Dionysus, uh, he turns water into wine, uh, which shouldn't be such a, uh, such a difficult thing to believe, given that Dionysus was the god of wine. 
in Greek mythology. Of, of course, if anyone's going to turn water into wine, it's going to be the god of wine, don't you think? And after establishing the parallels, they then, they then try to show that these myths predate Christianity, therefore Christianity borrowed uh, from these myths to cobble together its own biblical narrative of the life of Christ. There are a couple of major problems with this thesis, and I'm shocked that none of the people who put together movies like Zeitgeist or The God Who Wasn't There have the decency or the intellectual honesty to even try to confront these particular arguments or these particular problems with the, the ideas they're promulgating. The first is, the first thing we need to understand about these myths is we've already established that they evolve. Of course, if you're going to claim that Christianity is simply the next rung in the evolution of these myths, you're already admitting that they evolve. In fact, uh, these myths live different lives at the same time. You had one family who adhered to one version of the myth and another family across the street who adhered to a different version of the same myth. Now the evidence we have about these myths and the supposed parallels to Christianity all come from after Christianity. With the exception of the Egyptian myths of Osiris and Horus, there is no uh, pagan Christian synthesis in terms of the myths that are being submitted that exist in extant documents. That is, all of the documentation that shows these myths as existing in a Christ-like form come from after the time of Christianity. All of the material associated with these myths prior to Christ show them to be nothing at all like Christianity at all. This indicates, let, let, me, let me cover this real quick, you have the myth that has a nothing at all like Christ's life on the backside of Christ. And you have these same myths that look a lot like Christ after the time of Christ. This implies that the borrowing was not from paganism to Christianity, but it was rather from Christianity to paganism. Uh, but like I said, there were myths, particularly the Egyptian myths, that didn't adhere to this particular timeline. The myth of Horus and the myth of Osiris do predate Christianity, but they're not all that similar to Christianity. There was a death and what can be construed as a resurrection, but it was a very different type of resurrection than the one that Christianity had. All of the instances that can be construed as death, burial, resurrection, or a dying, rising God in terms of non-Christian mythology pre-Christ, all of those are described in terms of the cycles of nature. Hence, resurrection is not really a great term to describe them. Rebirth would be a better term, in the same sense that nature is reborn when spring comes around and is uh, fully mature when summer's here, but begins to die when uh, fall and then eventually winter come. All of the old myths that are pre-Christian and are not themselves Christian all evolve around that. Christianity has nothing to do with the cycles of nature. Resurrection is a perfectly appropriate word to use for Christianity, but it's not uh, for Osiris or Horus. And those are the only ones that legitimately predate Christianity. So we have a, a corpus of literary mythology that resembles Christianity after the Christian era. And these same myths, during their lifetimes prior to the Christian era, looked much less like Christ uh, or Christianity than they did after Christianity. Uh, that's the first point. So I was wanting to end uh, the first part of this two-part video series with the musing. Isn't it strange that by far and large the people who dismiss the historicity of Jesus do so on what they consider to be a lack of evidence? You bring up that Josephus mentioned Jesus twice and they'll tell you, well, the first time was a Christian forgery, which is partly true. And when you mention the second time, where Josephus mentions uh, James, and specifically mentions James as the brother of Jesus who was called Christ, they say, well, that's a different James who's a brother of a different Jesus who was called Christ. You point out that Tacitus mentions early Christians and Jesus being crucified under the particular uh, emperor whose name I 
can't recall. And they say, well, that's illegitimate because it's not corroborated by Philo of Alexandria. You can see where this is going. The evidence or the qualification of the evidence takes a continual step back, step back, step back, step back. No amount of evidence will ever be enough uh, to win them over to the thesis that Jesus existed. Now, juxtapose that against the issue that we're having now uh, concerning the myths we're talking about with no evidence prior to Christ of their being Christ-like and all the evidence to support that thesis coming after Christianity. Isn't it odd how they're willing to accept the notion that Christianity basically stole its story from other myths with far less uh, information, far less evidence to support it than Jesus, the historical Jesus has. That, to me, indicates the quintessential shut mind.